Well, fear is a very powerful motivator. In fact, it's really more of a manipulator because fear affects our emotions. But it can also affect our actions because our actions kind of flow out of our emotions, don't they? Sometimes fear can paralyze us. Because of its ability to control the mind, fear sells. Uh, Some of the biggest Hollywood box office hits ever are scary movies. Like uh, you can think of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining or Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds or um, one of Stephen King's novels that was made into a movie was It. And uh, man, I I don't know if you saw that movie. If you didn't, don't see it. Um, if you did, it's too late. Uh, boy, the clowns. I mean, if, you're, if you know the plot. I, mean, I don't know how the clown industry ever survived that, that movie. But, uh, but the year was 1975. I was actually seven years old. And uh, there was a big cultural phenomena that occurred. And that's because uh, Steven Spielberg's Jaws, the movie, came out. And uh, so, like many others, my family went as a group to go see this movie. I was only seven years old. Um, I remember taking my security blanket with me to the theater. And uh, I know you're thinking, seven years old, he still sleeps with a security blanket. I'm 53, I still sleep with a security blanket. But anyway, um, and I would hide behind that blanket during the scariest parts of the movie in in the theater. And of course, those musical notes that are forever etched in our minds that would trigger that fear. Da-da, da-da, da-da. But you know, even at age seven, I was smart enough to realize that a giant shark was not going to jump off of the screen, spill my popcorn, and eat me for lunch. But somehow, I was still scared. Not just me, everybody in the theater was scared in my defense. But why? Because of feelings. If you go to a scary movie, you know that the monster or whatever it is is not real, and yet you still feel afraid, don't you? Blood pressure goes up, something physiologically takes place. You can still be scared because the movie makers manipulate your mind so that you begin to feel a reality that's not really there. You may know it's not real, but you feel like it's real. So you get scared. Feelings don't have an intellect. All they can do is react. But having faith, like we've been studying and like we've been singing about today, is not based on how you feel. In this great Hall of Faith chapter that we started looking at last week, the writer is calling on us to act based on faith, not feelings. He wants us to overcome our feelings and have unwavering faith no matter what we're facing. In fact, the word faith is used 25 times in this one single chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. So as we continue this journey through the book of Hebrews, we're uh, sort of coming up on third base, rounding toward home. We've got two chapters uh, left after this chapter. And the writer has been talking about trusting God in trying times. So this idea of faith or trust is pervasive throughout the whole letter because as we remember, the context was the late 60s AD when the... uh, crazy emperor Nero was just slaughtering Christians, burning people at the stake, um, was going bananas, and many believers, many Christians in that setting were contemplating disassociating with the Christian faith and reverting back to the religion of Judaism, which at that time was still sort of under the protection, if you will, of, of Rome. And so really, Hebrews chapter 11 sort of is a a climax, a sort of bringing it all together. He's got some more things to say in chapters 12 and 13, some more practical things to say, but he's been making a case. 
And he's been making it through logic, through the appeal to Old Testament truth that these believers knew well because they had gotten saved. They had trusted in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation, having come out of the Jewish faith. So they knew the Old Testament Scriptures. So he's made his arguments through logic, through appeal to Old Testament, uh, through an appeal to Jesus Christ, the one who saved them, the one who shed His blood for them. He's also made his his challenge and his case through appeal to strong warnings. I mean, he's given some pretty heavy warnings. So he gives five of them in all. We've looked at four of them, and we're going to look at one more in chapter 12. But we introduced this chapter last week, so I won't spend a whole lot of time rehashing that. But I mentioned that as we, as I was kind of studying through this, I couldn't really put all the material into one message. So we looked at part one last week, and I want to invite you to turn to chapter 11 once again, and we'll pick up with verse 8. And I want to give seven more characteristics of an unwavering faith. Seven characteristics of an unwavering faith. This would go with the five that we introduced last week. So really there are at least 12 principles that you can draw from this rich, rich uh, passage, chapter 11, uh, that should motivate us to have unwavering faith. The first thing we want to understand is that unwavering faith is unafraid of the unknown. Unwavering faith is unafraid of the unknown. One of the biggest fears we face is fear of the unknown. In fact, you really could say that all fear can be reduced to fear of the unknown. Because if we can see it, if we understand it, if we know it, if we know the outcome, if we have all the facts and the data, you know, uh, we may not be afraid. But fear of the unknown is a, a real formidable foe. An unwavering faith is never afraid of the unknown. He he uses Abraham as an example in verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. This is referring back to Genesis chapter 12, 2,000 years before Christ. And God made this unconditional promise to Abraham. He said, trust me, follow me, go where I want you to go, And the blessings will be unbelievable. They will be actually universal, and they will transcend time, and they will affect everyone. And so Abraham went. He'd never been that way before. I mean, he couldn't look it up on Google Maps. He couldn't pull out even a paper map. This was was unknown territory. He didn't know what awaited him there, right? Um, But he focused on what he did know. What did he know? He knew that God is faithful, that God, the creator of the universe, is all-powerful. He knew that God did know the way, so it really didn't matter if he did because he was just going where God told him to go. And he knew exactly what God was telling him to do. So he knew enough, and his faith kicked in, and he did it. He had unwavering faith. Unwavering faith recognizes that we don't know what we don't know. And that's okay. It's okay to not know some things when you serve the Lord. So there's no reason to focus on what you don't know. It's a waste of time to even worry about it. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's where his focus was. Not on what he didn't know, but on what he knew. So unwavering faith is unafraid of the unknown. Unwavering faith doesn't have to know everything to be comfortable and confident and content. So the challenge is to be at peace with what we don't know. Because we don't have the mind of God. We live in a finite world constrained by time, space, and matter. And by the way, sold under sin. Where a lot of bad things happen to a lot of good people. We don't understand it. But we don't have to understand it. Unwavering faith doesn't cater to fear. But secondly, unwavering faith is unfazed by the impossible. That's because with God all things are possible. He continues down his line of thought here with Abraham and Sarah. And reminds us that by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age. It was impossible. For her to have children. But 
She was unfazed by the impossible. See, she and Abraham knew that God had promised Abraham many descendants. We're going to come back to that in a moment. And based on the promise of God and their unwavering faith, whether or not it was impossible was irrelevant. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand, which is by the seashore. Because Sarah was unfazed by the impossible, her descendants are beyond counting. See, her focus wasn't whether, it was really irrelevant whether it was impossible or not. It had no bearing on what she was going to do. God said it and she believed it. That was unwavering faith. You know, Jesus uh, had a thing or two to say about what is what might appear impossible with man, but is possible with God. You remember the story? Uh, Jesus is conf <clears throat> confronted by a rich young ruler. And he explains to that rich young ruler that he needs to keep the law and he needs to keep it perfectly if he wants to get into heaven. Because as Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, the, perf the, the, what heaven, the righteousness that heaven requires is perfect righteousness. He said in Matthew 5.48, you've got to be perfect like my heavenly Father is perfect. And this rich young ruler thought, I've kept all the laws. He had them all checked off. And then Jesus quickly zeroed in on a few that he hadn't kept. And he went away sad. And then Jesus said, you know what? It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And his disciples said, well, then how can they, how can they be saved? And this is what Jesus said. With men, this, may, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. That's a great promise. So unwavering faith is unfazed by the impossible. What impossible obstacles are you facing in your life right now? I hope there are some, because it gives us the opportunity to exercise faith. You know, often we go through life and everything is possible. We can solve our problems with our income. We have good health. We have great relationships. Everything's wonderful. Then we don't really need to exercise faith too much. But when you have some obstacles, and, and especially when those obstacles seem absolutely impossible... How in the world are we going to get through this one? How in the world are we going to solve that problem? Well, unwavering faith says, don't let that phase you. Now, that doesn't mean you can just name it and claim it and whatever you want you're going to have, no matter how impossible. But what it means is that whether something seems possible or not is not relevant to how you respond. Your trust is in God. If He wants it to happen, it will happen. If not, it won't. But either way, he's still God. Do you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, uh, the, in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 3? And the king said, you got to bow down and worship this false god. They said, no way. He said, you're going to burn for it. They said, you know what? We're, we're not going to worship this false god. We believe God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, he's still God. Our trust is in him. And in that case, he, he delivered them. See, some things are impossible, but so what? Unwavering faith is uh, unfazed by the impossible. God is bigger than that. You heard the, uh, this is for you, Kelly. You heard the story of the man on the beach that found a bottle that washed up on the beach, you know, and sure enough, he opens out, pops a genie, and uh, the genie said, you can have one wish. I guess it was, there was a recession or something. So only one wish, right? And, uh, and the guy says, well, you know what? I've always, I love the beach, and I've always wanted to go to Hawaii. But, man, I am scared to death to fly. I, I don't like boats. So my wish is for you to build this bridge all the way from California to Hawaii. The genie, genie threw up his hand and said, are you kidding me? Do you have any idea what you're asking? You know how impossible that is? I mean, just think about from an engineering perspective you know, standpoint alone. I'd, we'd have to put pylons all the way down to the sea floor. We'd have, I don't know how we're going to get the trucks out there and the pavement trucks and the concrete. I mean, just for scientifically and the laws of gravity, how, this is, that's un, I can't believe you even asked such a thing. Don't you know how impossible that is? And so the guy says, well, okay, I guess, uh, he says, ask me something else. So the guy says, okay. Um, well, I got this friend, Kelton Fuller. Can you, he, he needs his life straight now. Can you fix him? The genie says, 
Now, did you want that to have two lanes or four lanes on that bridge? Some things are impossible, Kelly. I told you. I told you. So, I, see, the preacher always gets the last word. So, uh, Kelly was was harassing me this morning during band practice about making sure it's a heresy-free day. So, uh, I said, well, all right, I got something for you. Number three, unwavering faith is undistracted in its focus. Undistracted in its focus. You know, we've talked a lot about this issue of perspective, of focus, because the writer talks a lot about it. He starts out with it in chapters one and two, and it's a recurring theme, because what they were facing was horrific. Frankly, most of us in this room have not had to face the type of persecution unto death for our faith that many believers in that day did. And by the way, many have for 2,000 years, and many are today, right now, in this time, being persecuted for the faith. And so the question is, are you focused on the here and the now or the then and the there? Weak faith is consumed by what's around it, by the present. But unwavering faith is undistracted in its focus. The writer goes on, these all died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. See, Abraham and Sarah, they didn't get the promised kingdom yet. (laughs) Daniel 12 and Isaiah 26 tell us they're going to experience it like every other believer of all ages when Christ comes back and establishes that kingdom. But they didn't get it in their day, but they were assured of them. And they embraced them. And they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Do you understand their perspective there? Do you understand their viewpoint? Their viewpoint was that God has made us this promise. Boy, we want it as bad as we've ever wanted anything, and we trust God to give it. But our faith is in God, and our focus is on the realization of that promise. Whatever other struggles, and if you know the story of Abraham, boy, he he had one battle after another. Their focus was steadfast on what comes ahead. They said, For those who say such things declare plainly, they seek a homeland. By their confession, they declared that their home was not this earth, that there's something better coming. They desire a better, that is a heavenly country, the writer tells us. And that's the key. That's the key throughout Hebrews. What's coming is far better than what now is. I don't have it on the screen, but you remember we looked back in chapter 2. We talked about how it sort of sets the tone for the whole letter when he tells the readers, and by extension us, that the world to come has not been put in subjection to angels, but to the Son of God himself. See, These first century believers were into a lot of mystical, uh, angelic type uh, stuff, and, and they, 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 he reminded them that this Jesus who saved them is far better, far superior than angels. In fact, he's so superior that one day the whole world is going to be in subjection to him when he sits on the throne and rules with a rod of iron and perfect peace and, and justice. And he says, the, uh, the world to come of which we speak in chapter 2. In other words, this letter that we're writing to you is all about the world to come. And it makes sense because given what they were going through, there's no way he could sell them on what they were going through. <laughs> Maybe some of you are sitting here today and you're going through hell on earth and there's no way you can just say, oh, I'll just grin and bear it. You need to keep your focus undistracted by what's around you and focused on what lies ahead. You know, sometimes the best way to make it through your trials is to stop fixating on them. Where's your focus? Where's your focus? Uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking to someone, I think it was on a Wednesday night, and they reminded me of a a short little illustration. It's actually a, a, a very helpful, instructive test that is often used in the business world, and I've used it through the years in different contexts. And uh, I was kind of working through this message this week, and I thought this would be a good illustration of, of focus. So I'm going to uh, give you this test, okay? No extra charge, okay? And, uh, but it's a contest. Now, some of you might have seen this test before. If you have, don't blow it. Don't say anything. Just play along because we we want it to be instructive for those who maybe haven't seen it. So don't give away the answer. But basically, we're going to divide the the, the room up into men and women. And we're going to see who is more observant 
men or women. Now, I think every one of us knows that traditionally women are more observant, right? But here's our chance, men, to prove them wrong. So it doesn't matter where you're sitting, just, you know, in solidarity with women, you women will solve this puzzle or answer this question in a moment. Men, I'm with you. I already know the answer, so I can't participate. So I'm going to count on you, uh, to uh, everybody but Kelly anyway. You, I'm counting on you to be smart and uh, answer, this, uh, answer this question. All right, so what, I'm gonna, what it's going to be, I'm going to kind of set the stage. It's, just, it's less than a minute. You've got to watch cl cl closely and pay close attention. But it's a group of uh, young people passing a bas two basketballs around. Half of them are dressed in white. Half of them are dressed in black. Your job is to focus and count how many times the white team, the team dressed in white, passes the basketball. All right? You with me? So you're, you're counting. Watch how many times the team dressed in white passes the basketball. All right? And then I'll pause it, and then we'll see uh, what uh, our answers came up with, and then we'll see what the answer is. You ready? The question? I, I want to know if pass means like a technical term or passing to what? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I think it will be obvious what a pass is when the ball goes from one player to another. Doesn't matter how, they can do a Harlem Globetrotter, you know, behind the back, under the left, but if they're passing the ball from one player to another on their team, it counts. You with me? All right. Guys, we're going to need help. All right, here we go. <laughs> uh, I'm not very confident. All right. So how many passes does the team in white, in white make? It's an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? He's about to tell us the answer, so I paused it. All right, so how many times did the team in white pass? Even. How many? Twelve. Twelve? Fourteen. Who said fourteen? Fourteen. Fourteen, so we've got a fourteen and twelve on the guy's side. Fourteen? Fifteen. Fifteen. How many? Fourteen or thirteen. Okay. <laughs> You're going to kind of straddle the fence there, not a bad... Are you planning to run for office someday? That's the question. Well, that's true. It's kind of hard to tell. So we need a we need to come to a consensus. So we need a final answer from the women and a final answer from the men. And again, if you've seen this before and you know the answer, don't participate. But uh, we've had a 14 and a 12 from the men, 15. and a 15. You think it was 15? 13. 13. 13. Well, all right, men. What do you want to go with for your final answer? Then we'll ask the women. We'll let you go first so they can. What do you think? Twelve. Twelve? Thirteen. Thirteen. So I'm hearing a lot of thirteens. All right. Thirteen is the men's final answer. Women? How many? Fourteen. Sixteen. I need a final answer. Fourteen. So we're going to go with fourteen for the women. What did we decide for the men? Thirteen. All right. You want to flip the lights off again? Sorry. <laughs> Getting your exercise, Fred. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? easy to miss something you're not looking for. Did you all see it? How come you didn't see it the first time? I think sometimes, <laughs> what are you laughing at? I don't think it was the same clip. It was the same clip. Exactly the same clip. <laughs> so, you know, it's easy to miss something when you're not looking for it, right? 
I think sometimes we're so distracted by life's trials and hardships that we're oblivious to whatever else might be happening in our lives right before our eyes. God is always at work. Now, don't stretch the analogy. I'm not suggesting God is a moonwalking bear or gorilla. But what I'm saying is that it's easy to miss what you're not looking for. Are you looking for God in the midst of your trials? Where is your focus? Unwavering faith is undistracted in its focus. Number four, unwavering faith is unreserved in its declaration. See, faith is not merely internal. It's something so vital to your very being, your worldview, that it can't help but come out. You talk about it routinely. And this is uh, what we see in the next several verses as they talk, starting with Abraham and his descendants, each passed down this hope of the promise to succeeding uh, generations. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, we don't have time because there's a lot of, of powerful information in this passage that I just want to rapid fire get to. So I can't really t take a lot of diversions. But if you go back and you read the account of Abraham and Isaac, a fascinating story in Genesis chapter 22, you find out as, as he's taking in obedience to the command of the Lord, his only son Isaac, the son of promise, by the way. You remember God promised Abraham that he would have descendants as the sand of the sea. Then he's got this one son who was a miracle son, born out of the impossible. And then God says, now I want you to sacrifice him. So they're going up to the hill and... First indication of Abraham's faith is he says to the men that are with him helping carry the stuff, hey, you guys wait here. The lad and I are going to go up and offer a sacrifice, and the lad and I will return. <laughs> so what does that tell you? Abraham knew that, that, that somehow this was going to be okay. But anyway, the interesting conversation here is at one point Isaac, the son, says, uh, Dad, and I'm paraphrasing, but you know, I see the wood and I see the fire. Remember, they, they didn't have lighters or matches. They carried fire on a stick, you know. But uh, where's the lamb? And what did Abraham say? Son, God will provide a lamb. And there's no doubt in my mind, even though the text doesn't record it, but from what we see in the rest of Genesis, that, God, that Abraham in that moment began to explain to his son Isaac or perhaps reiterate what he'd already explained to him many times before, the promise of God. Remember, historical narratives don't always tell us everything that was said. They give us the big picture. But undoubtedly, when Abraham told Isaac, look, don't you remember? God promised that we would have descendants. I don't know how, but God's going to provide a lamb, Isaac. It's going to be okay. And he he declared the promise of God. And that's what unwavering faith does. And then uh, by faith, Isaac then blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. In other words, Isaac passed on to his sons this promise, things to come, this future promise of God. And they, he was unwavering in his declaration. And then by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. So Jacob blessed Joseph and his sons in Genesis 48, but we also know in Genesis 49 that Jacob called the 12, his 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And he blessed them and he told them, look, I, you know, I didn't realize the promised kingdom that was promised to Abraham in my lifetime, but you need to keep trusting God. It's coming. And he passed it on to them. And then Joseph, at the end of Genesis 50, a beautiful passage at the very end of the book of Genesis, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. So Joseph in turn blesses his sons. So you see this continuation of people explaining the promises to their descendants and saying, you know what, we're not going to waver. We're not going to say, well, it never happened. I guess I'll just, I better not say anything because what if it doesn't happen again? No, no. Unreserved in their declaration. When's the last time you passed on the promises of God to your children or your grandchildren? You know, if all we had was an audio recording of your life, would we consider you a man or a woman of faith? Do you talk about the promises of God unwaveringly? Number five, unwavering faith is undaunted by challenges. You know, there's two kinds of people in the world. The woe is meers 
and the bring it honors. An unwavering faith says, you know what? I, there may be some challenges, I get that, but bring it on. My God is able. And then he uses Moses here in this next section as a quintessential example of someone undaunted by the challenges. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to call the son of Pharaoh's to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction. So Moses was so confident in God, so confident that his faith was right, that he fearlessly confronted his enemies and faced his trials with boldness. He would rather suffer affliction than abandon his faith. And the believer today with unwavering faith understands the fundamental principles, the principle of Scripture that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He goes on talking about Moses. He says he, he, he did not esteem the reproach of Christ, the Messiah there, which was what he was looking toward, uh, of, 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 and the greater riches in treasures in Egypt. He instead looked for the reward. See, he had a, he had a deep appreciation for the promises of God. And because of that, he chose the reward associated with the coming Messiah over the temporary material wealth that he could have had in Egypt. I mean, if you remember, he could have had it all in, in, in Egypt. Um, and he says, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. This is The context here is when, if you remember, this is before he led the children of Israel, way before, 40 years before, he, he was walking along and he sees an Egyptian kill a Hebrew, one of his kinsmen, and Moses in anger kills the Egyptian. And then Pharaoh says, uh, I'm not very happy with that. And so he's going to try to kill Moses. And Moses fled Egypt by himself and uh, went to Midian. And he says he was seeing him, capital H there, God, who was invisible. So Moses saw the invisible. He had a spiritual perception that all people with unwavering faith have. And then we talked about that in last week's message. Um, so he, he, he was willing to stand up and confront this challenge, and he didn't, let, he didn't let the king win. In fact, he comes back under the command of God and confronts the, the Pharaoh in a powerful way. Remember when he says, let my people go. And then speaking of that, the final miracle is the Passover. By faith, he kept the Passover. He was undeterred by the king's anger and the king's magicians and the king's armies. And he, he walked by faith. And by faith, he passed through the Red Sea. I mean, think about that. You know, there's all these chariots and this mighty army chasing after these millions of Jews that were fleeing. And God opened up the Red Sea. Faith. Anywhere along the way, Moses could have stumbled and seen, thing, seen the challenges as all-consuming. But he was undaunted by the challenges. He was undaunted by the challenges. Number six, he was unmoved, or uh, unwavering faith is unmoved by its suffering. So the writer closes chapter 11 with example after example of people whose faith allowed them to endure extremely difficult circumstances and suffering. And I want to just go through them quickly. Um, I mean, I could have brought in all kinds of cross-references here, but the text itself is so rich, we're just going to let it uh, speak for itself as a witness to help us embolden our faith. How is unwavering faith unmoved by suffering? Well, first of all, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. So enemies can be supernaturally defeated by God. That's something to remember. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who did not believe. Remember Rahab in the story? and She and her family survived because of her faith when everyone else in the city perished. And he goes on, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Boy, Gideon, what a great example. He defeated the Midianite army, even though he was outnumbered 450 to 1. Gideon had an army of 300 men. The Midianites had 135,000, yet God was in control. And God had a secret plan that he revealed to Gideon. Gideon divided the army, remember, into three groups. 
And he gave everybody a pitcher, a trumpet, and a torch. And at the appointed time, 300 trumpets blasted into the air. 300 hands raised their pitchers and smashed them to the ground. And 300 burning torch torches lit up the night sky. And then they all cried out in unison, 300 warriors, the sword of the Lord, end of Gideon. The sword of the Lord, end of Gideon. And what happened? The Midianites were thrown into a panic. They, some of them in the confusion committed suicide. Some of them killed each other. And, and they were routed. It was a glorious victory for God. Because Gideon had faith. Or Barak. Barak was summoned by Deborah, the prophetess who was judging Israel at the time. And Deborah told Barak to raise a militia army of 10,000 men to fight Jabin, the king of Canaan. He'd been a thorn in the side of Israel for 20 years, oppressing them. And during the battle... The Lord sent a great thunderstorm, and the, the rain swelled the Kishon River and the plains surrounding the battle area, and the Canaanites' 900 iron chariots were useless, and the, the Israelites routed them. Or Samson. Think about the story of Samson. Many of you have studied that time after time. His physical strength and physical feats were uh, just amazing. He, with his bare hands, he killed a young lion that attacked him. He once gathered 300 foxes and tied them together and then sent them through the grain fields with torches in their tails to destroy the crops of the Philistines. On one occasion, he broke the ropes which the enemy had used to bind him. And one time he killed a thousand Philistine soldiers with nothing but the jawbone of a donkey. Or Jephthah. Jephthah had an incredible campaign against the Ammonites. Or David. King David, I mean, his life, his coming on the scene started in a profound way when he accepted Goliath's challenge, that great Philistine warrior, for a Hebrew to do battle with him. And David, whose faith was in the Lord, uh, recognized right away that this nine-foot-tall giant weighted down with all this heavy armor was really only prepared for close-range battle. So David's strategy was to fight him from a distance. What did he do? He took five smooth stones from a brook, he had a sling, and, and he, 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 he slung that rock right at Goliath with unflinching faith, and he, and he killed him. And he became a hero in the nation. Or Samuel. Samuel did battle with the Philistines too. Remember that story? When the Lord caused a loud clap of thunder that confused the Philistines and caused them to retreat so that Samuel and the Israelites were able to drive them back. And by the way, it was that story, that occasion where Samuel, in thanking God for answering his prayers, set up a memorial, a stone marker, which the Bible tells us he called Ebenezer. Remember that? Here, here I lay my Ebenezer. That's a stone memorial. And uh, it means the Lord has helped us. The Lord has helped us. And then he mentions all kinds of other prophets as well. He talks about... He alludes, anyway, to Daniel, who shut the lion's mouths, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as I mentioned earlier, that escaped the fiery furnace, uh, or Elijah and Elisha and Jeremiah, that all avoided execution. Or notice this, women received their dead raised to life again. Uh, that's most likely a reference to Elijah and Elisha again. Elijah raised the widow's son. Elisha raised the Shunammite woman's son, both of whom uh, had died. Many people were tortured. Many people have endured mockings and scourging and been imprisoned. And yet they were unmoved by this suffering. People have been stoned. I mean, see, see how he's just calling to mind all of these great men and women of the faith. People have been sawn in two. The, we don't know this from Scripture, but extra biblical literature tells us Isaiah, the prophet, was sawn in two by King Manasseh. Uh, he references people wandering about in sheepskins and goatskins, uh, Elijah again, and John the Baptist. Unwavering faith faces suffering with confidence and assurance and even defiance. And the writer almost has sort of a doxology here, just says the world is not even worthy of these people. And he says, compare yourself running like scared chickens afraid of Nero, and disassociating with the very Jesus Christ who saved you. See, the world was not worthy of the God-fearing men and women of the faith that he just rehearsed. 
Unwavering faith is unmoved by its suffering. Never evaluate your worth using the world's yardstick. Number seven, the last one, unwavering faith is unashamed in its testimony. Unashamed in its testimony. Faith speaks and faith speaks to others. We've already seen how faith is passed down from generation to generation, but faith speaks outside of the immediate family as well. It has a good testimony. He says, all of these having obtained a good testimony through faith because of their faith. Um, they, didn't, they didn't realize their end times, what we call eschatological hopes and dreams. It wasn't time yet. God had planned something better. Some, God's plan didn't involve that. They're going to realize them. You better believe it. But they'll come back in their glorified bodies and realize them. And yet in spite of these unrealized hopes, they maintained a good testimony. And this is a, a frequent theme in this chapter. He, he kind of alludes to it three or four times. He, he, he starts out at the beginning in verse 2, talking about how the elders obtained a good testimony. We looked at that last week. Then in verse 13, which we looked at a little bit ago, he talks about how they confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. To confess there means to, to say out loud, to, to, to talk to others about it. To confess to others is the idea there. And, uh, and then here, once again, he, he talks about them having a good confession, a good testimony. The last verse is really what kind of sums it all up for us today. For the original readers and for us today, 2,000 years later, as we face our own trials and tribulations, tribulations, which, by the way, may become more severe as we look at the landscape around us. He says, God having provided something better for us. See, it's better for us that these future hopes of these heroes of old were delayed. Because that way we too can experience future rewards and blessings in the kingdom someday. If the kingdom had been inaugurated in Abraham's day, or Isaac's day, or Jacob's day, or Moses' day, then... You know, we wouldn't be here, first of all, and we wouldn't get to experience the, the fullness, the inauguration, the culmination of God's kingdom blessings. In other words, the realization of their hopes that still awaits them awaits all believers. We're all in this together. So don't be ashamed. Follow their example. Maintain a good testimony just the way that they did. Unwavering faith. So what monsters are you facing today? I mentioned recently that the book of Proverbs reminds us the heart knows its own bitterness and a stranger does not share its joy. In other words, look, we all have our battles that we're facing. And I wouldn't pretend to fully understand yours and you wouldn't understand mine. But what is it that you fear in your life might jump off the screen and spill your popcorn or gobble you up, right? Unwavering faith does not operate based on feelings. It operates based on the empirical, provable promises of God. So there it is. Unafraid of the unknown, unwavering faith is unfazed by the impossible, undistracted in its focus, unreserved in its declaration, undaunted by the challenges, unmoved by its suffering, unashamed in its testimony. So what's the takeaway? Well, like the old song says, I would just say it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It may not be worth it all now. We may think, wow, boy, if I put out my T-chart, you know, maybe I should abandon this. No, that's not the focus. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for uh, this passage almost more than we can really comprehend in one sitting, so filled with uh, examples and admonitions and exhortations to faith. Lord, strengthen our faith. Embolden our faith. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, if there's one here today who hasn't taken that initial step of faith by trusting in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died and rose again, to pay their personal penalty for sin, by trusting in Him to give them the gift of eternal life that can only come from Jesus, I pray that today, would be the day of salvation, that first step of faith. And Lord, for those who do know you, I just pray that you would forgive our lack of faith, help us in our times of unbelief, 
and strengthen our faith as we keep our eyes fixed on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand for a closing song.